you are just joining me. Um, I am an internal medicine physician and I'm also board certified in lifestyle medicine and obesity medicine. And this place, these Facebook lives are really a place for education, questions you have. I get so many questions all the time in the clinic, various social media places. Um, so you can really ask me anything. Um, I can't answer personal medical questions, but um, everything else is fair game. So send it along. Um, if you want to ask um, afterwards, you can leave it in the comments um, and also post this to my YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel, um, Weight Medicine with Dr. Megan. Um, and then I also have um, a concierge weight medicine practice. So if you're a patient in Massachusetts and you're interested in working with me, um, you can go to www.weightmedicinemd com to find out more um, and if you're outside of Massachusetts I also help patients or I help clients with um, with goal setting and habit formation with regards to life coaching so let me know if you have any questions about any of that always happy to answer those questions but today I'm gonna jump right into the questions that were sent earlier and if there are any questions that come up um, please feel free to type it in the chat and we'll go from there so let's get started. Okay. First question is what is the best way to deal with hair loss if it occurs with zep bound? And I had another question that was about um, hair loss if it occurs with Topamax. And these are great questions. And it actually, um, this is a pretty common scenario because um, hair loss is a pretty heterogeneous um, issue. So lots of different things can cause hair loss, but certainly for people who are on um, uh, weight medication, um, if you're losing weight at a particularly um, good clip, it can trigger what we call telogen effluvium, which is something that can happen um, there's something that happens with your hair and essentially what happens is the hair follicles normally they have a they're pretty spaced out and pretty regular in terms of when the hair is growing when it's shedding and the various stages of that but for telogen effluvium and if anybody's been pregnant you definitely have um may have experienced this before what happens is and this can happen with a variety of life stressors um the hair follicles uh tend to the, the hair growth cycle, there's more, um, they line up closer together. So there's more in a certain phase than you would expect. And so then there's more falling out in the phase than you would expect. So this happens a lot in pregnancy. Um, women about three months after giving birth, all of a sudden there's like this, these clumps of hair in the shower and where did this come from? Um, so that's essentially what happens is the the cycle of the hair um, changes and so it's growing together but then it's also falling out together at the same time so any sort of stressful life event um, talk about hair loss with um, uh, with medications for anybody who's joining um, anything that's very stressful to the body can trigger this kind of response so um, it's not completely uncommon that this can happen and it's usually temporary but um, certainly for patients who are on weight medication you also want to make sure there's nothing else going on. So certainly hair growth can be inhibited by um, nutrition. You want to make sure you're getting enough protein. Uh, I always check labs for thyroid and um, iron issues. Um, and usually hair loss is not something that I wait around a lot on. So sometimes for a variety of medical issues, you know, what you want to do is kind of track them over time and see if there's a trend. But usually for hair loss, I don't wait for that because time is hair. So essentially, I will see a patient, we'll get some labs, if everything looks normal, it's, it's highly likely that it is telogen effluvium, but I will usually always have that person see a dermatologist as well, because you never know, you are going to have the, um, the odd patient that has, you know, an autoimmune issue with their scalp, um, that, you know, the intervention for that's going to be a lot different. There's a variety of great medications now for, um, for hair loss. So I usually always have that person follow up on a, you know, pretty quickly with their dermatologist as well, just to make sure that nothing else is going on. So that's where I would start. So see your, um, see your physician and then probably see uh, your derm as well. Um, okay. So next question is I was prescribed 
with Gobi, but it made me very, very sick, constant nausea and headache. Any suggestions for an alternative? Um, yes. You know, we try, we never know exactly how these medications are going to play out for people. And so um, if you try Bugovi, you know, it really depends on how, um, how long a trial you want to give it to. So um, I have some patients that, you know, the first two doses, they feel like it's, you know, food poisoning. It's just a lot of nausea, it's a lot of vomiting, but then it gets better. Um, and I have some patients who say, I'm done. I do not want anything else to do with this. So, and that's totally reasonable too. But sometimes, you know, people are giving it a long time and they still have this, these really pervasive feelings of nausea, vomiting, you know, uh, reflux, what have you. And so it, it's very individualized. So, you know, you want to see um, if you've given it you know, a reasonable amount of time, several weeks, and the symptoms aren't going away, you know, my first option will be usually, and this is just general, this is not related to any one person in particular, um, my first option will usually be to see if there's anything, any medication we can use to help decrease the side effects, whether that's an anti-nausea medication, whether that's an anti-diarrhea medication, whether it's a reflux medication, is there something that we have that is going to make this a little bit more tolerable so we can see if this medication works a little bit longer because it takes sometimes it takes so long to get these medications approved and if you once you get it approved and you have it like you really want to make the most of it i want to i always want to make sure we're, we're giving it the best shot we can for patients so you you want to see if there's any way you can kind of work with this and there's always the chance that these side effects will go away with time so that would be great um so that's you know, step number one is just making sure you've kind of exhausted the possibilities with your physician in terms of what else can you do the other thing that i think uh is very helpful is maybe just going on a longer titration because if we're thinking you know these medications are lifelong so if you get to the highest dose in three months versus six months over the course of your life is that going to make a huge difference probably not so it might make sense for these people who are having stronger side effects maybe you just keep stay on that low dose the starting dose for three months instead of one month like there's no rush and things might actually go become a little bit easier, a bit more tolerable if you give it three months um, or whatever you and your physician decide. But certainly I think it's worth, you know, extending that timeline as well as an option. Um, and then also good thing to think about that I think maybe we don't talk about enough is really making sure that if you're having a lot of nausea and vomiting, that you're really careful with the size of your meals. Number one, that you're kind of eating regularly because the nausea can often get worse if the stomach is completely empty. So eating regularly, but very small, bland meals. Um, if you're eating too much, of course, that's gonna trigger nausea and vomiting too. So you really wanna see if you can find a good balance, and then it's possible that you know, over time again, that, that these side effects may go away. But let's say you tried all that and none of it worked and you're like, this is just, sometimes it's just not the right medication for somebody, which is fine. Um, that happens with any, you know, medication category. Not all blood pressure medications work for everybody. Um, not all statins work for everybody. So sometimes it just, it's not going to work. And so what are your next steps? And usually, and this is aside from, you know, availability and insurance coverage, um, usually I'll just go to one of the other GLP-1 agonists or the G GLP-1 GIP agonists. Like, so if uh, for patients like this, you know, the next best thing to try would possibly be Zetbound or Munjaro would be the terzepatide. Um, and see if that works. A lot of times that has less side effects and um, slightly better overall effects for patients. So that would be the next one. And then you could also try um, liraglutide, which is also called Saxenda or, um, or Victoza. And the thing I like about Saxenda or uh, uh, liraglutide is that you can titrate that up 
quicker. You can titrate up over five weeks to get to the max dose. So, and you don't have to do that, but sometimes you'll get a better idea of, is this going to work for somebody a little bit sooner than you would for something like um, Zepbound. So you just have to play around with it. Again, this is like all other things being equal. You can find the medication and you can, um, and your insurance covers it. So uh, th that's where I would try if, you know, I definitely have patients that none of the injectables, that, you know, they don't want to try them or they can't get any of them approved. And then, you know, the step after that would be having a conversation with your physician about, you know, are there oral uh, weight medications that might be a better fit? Because we, they're much older. We've had them for a long time. They don't work as well. But if the injectables aren't working for you anyway, like you really have nothing to lose if there's going to be a suitable oral alternative. So definitely worth exploring that as well. Um, okay, so this is about, the next question is about loraglutide. Uh, I'm going to truncate this question a little bit. Okay. All right. So you, okay. So people who are using loraglutide for weight loss, you are causing a vast shortage for with people like myself with diabetes means we can't get our medication. My doctor is now trying to find something else without much luck. Um, I have heard this come up uh, from time to time. Um, people with uh, diabetes um, are very frustrated that they can't get their medication anymore. Of course, who wouldn't be, right? That's a, can completely understand that. Um, and it is, you know, um, it's a problem. It's a problem. Like if you've been on Ozempic for years and now you can't find it anywhere, of course, that is extremely frustrating. And, um, you know, I would hate for anybody to be in that situation. Um, so very understandable. Also, I don't think we talk as much about, you know, really under treating people who have, um, overweight or obesity. So, um, while we certainly don't want people who have diabetes to not have their medications, um, we also want to be able to treat people with uh, obesity or overweight who really we haven't been able to have as good uh, tools for in the past. And so I think a, a lot of this is um, a lot of this is out of our control in terms of you know manufacturing delays and supply issues and um that's completely understandable and i think um you know no nobody i don't think anybody who's going on these medications is trying to deprive other people of their medications but um i can certainly see how it's frustrating but also i think it's very important to consider that we now have tools to treat people that we didn't have before and um, people who have a higher BMI are at risk for so many chronic diseases anyway, including diabetes, you know, so many health issues that if we have a chance to intervene earlier and really make a difference, I mean, that is really a, a wonderful opportunity. And it's just a little unfortunate right now in this current setting with um, supply issues, with availability issues that that's going on. But I think it's something that, you know, that everybody's aware of and and ideally uh, is going to be resolved over time there certainly is certainly is demand um, as we all know so um, and I I did do um, maybe I haven't posted it yet I did do a video um, about generics um, and the availability of generics and the raglatide should be available this summer as a generic so that is exciting as well because there's going to be more people making it. Ideally, there's a better supply. So that's coming in the future. Um, but yeah, definitely can be a little frustrating for people right now. Um, okay, so does mall walking count as exercise? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, walking is walking if you're outside, if you're in a mall. I mean, it just... You want to make sure you're, um, if you're walking and you can do a moderate pace, which means you can carry on a conversation, but not like a long conversation. Um, that's always a good goal. Um, but, and then a vigorous pace would be, you really can't carry on much of a conversation at all. That's, that would be a very, very fast walk or running. Um, I think it counts. Definitely. Uh, next question is, I believe if I didn't exercise over an hour a day, it was pointless. 
Now I do better moving 20 minutes and then light weights. That has worked out much better for me. Okay, it's not not so much a question, but a statement, and I totally agree with that. Um, if I didn't exercise, yeah, I mean, don't don't expect yourself to go from zero to 60 overnight. Um, that uh, that is really that's a really good example actually of what happens for patients who are setting goals, whether it's, you know, losing weight or exercising consistently, whatever it is, we all have this tendency to this kind of all or nothing thinking. And that can really cause a lot of problems because, um, you know, if you don't do it perfectly, then why bother uh, is kind of where the mind goes with this. But you just have to be kind of on to yourself because I think that when we, you know, get into all or nothing thinking there's this kind of unintentional payoff like if I don't do it perfectly then like I don't have to do it um and our as I tell patients like our default is not exercising right the default human body is not like planning to go to the gym and like getting up at five in the morning to do so right like that's not our normal state so it does require some effort and if we tell ourselves that you know we're not doing it perfectly so why bother then you you don't actually have to put in that effort so there's kind of this sneaky kind of payoff to it that i think it's it's easy to um overlook if we're not on to ourselves and we all do this every human on the planet does this to some extent um and it's you know kind of our body's natural way of wanting to conserve energy and and all those types of things but um, yeah, I think always good to watch yourself when you're doing that all or nothing thinking because yeah, you don't definitely don't have to exercise 60 minutes a day. Um, it's really the consistency that's most important. And what I always like to tell people is, you know, just do like, if you, if you guys heard of like the seven minute workout, like that app that I love that app, it's so good. Like you could do seven minutes a day, one day a week and just start there and that's it. And then just do that consistently week after week. Then if you're doing that, do it twice in a row. So do 14 minutes or do seven minutes twice a week. That's it. Like the real important part is building the consistency and then you can expand the time and you can expand the effort um, as you go, but it's much more important to develop the habit. That's really where you want to start. So that, thank you for that example. That is excellent. Um, all right. Next question is, okay, this is a great question. Does having a physical job that gets in your steps in HR count as exercise or does your body get used to this routine? Uh, I think so. If you have a job where you're more active, um, but it's not, you're not like a professional athlete, right? So something where you're walking a lot, um, but it's not like a sport or you're not like teaching an exercise class, it would really classify, you could count that as, you know, actual exercise um that is what we would call non-exercise activity activity thermogenesis so neat is the acronym for that and uh, that's great if you have a job where you are very physically active um i think that's great i don't count that as exercise though i think it's a bonus um i think it's definitely um a great thing to have much you know much rather have patients who have a lot of activity built into their job as opposed to being completely sedentary um that's one of the things i like about medicine you know, when i'm not doing telehealth is i'm just i'm up walking all the time talking to patients and um you know it's very uh it can be pretty active at times which is great but um i wouldn't think of that kind of that non-exercise activity as exercise that makes sense. So I, I would just characterize it as like a bonus, but I wouldn't substitute in, you know, um, that for an exercise session. Uh, but you know, the recommendations in general are 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise and, or 75 to 90 minutes of vigorous activity, meaning you couldn't carry on a conversation and with moderate, you could. Um, so yeah, great. If you have a job that does that, um, okay, next question is, is weightlifting pointless if you're not consuming enough protein? I think that is a great question. And I think that's another good example of kind of all or nothing question. Um, so great example there. Uh, no, definitely not pointless. Um, not at all. Weightlifting is always a great idea. And, you know, to some extent in America, we're definitely going to be getting protein. So I don't think there's... Uh, 
unless you were like extremely malnourished. I, I, it's hard to see in our very like meat centric country how people are, you know, not at least getting some protein throughout the day, you know, unless of course you are on one of the weight medications and you're not eating a lot. But, you know, if you're having three meals a day, you're going to be getting some protein. Um, in general, for patients who are looking to, you know, lose weight, reduce their BMI, you do want to make sure you're being a little more calculated about your protein. So a good idea is about one gram to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. And per kilogram body weight, meaning, you know, your ideal body weight. Um, that's usually a good goal. And that's um, from the Obesity uh, Medicines Association. Um, but yeah, weightlifting is great, not pointless. You're probably definitely at least getting some protein. And those are the good guidelines if you want to get really um, focused about it. Um, and especially for patients who are losing weight on the weight medications, um, uh, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you are, are getting enough protein because you don't want to be losing muscle mass um, as you're losing weight. You want to preserve that or even build that if possible. Next question. Do you have an exit plan to get these patients off these medications? Um, no, definitely not. Um, I always tell patients that if you're on, if you restart this, have the idea that you're on this for life. Um, it's definitely an area of active research in terms of, um, you know, will patients be on this? You know, is there a, a, a way in the future for patients to go off of it or do kind of more maintenance dosing or what does that even look like but we really just don't have the answers for that right now um, and it may be that in five years ten years we have a much better idea we have a lot more studies that have a lot more answers in terms of okay this is what happens this is what we plan to do you know and when you get to this phase you this is the dose that you go this is the maintenance dose you go back onto. we don't have that information right now so I think anybody who is going on a weight medication should just mentally prepare to be on that for the rest of their life. And if that, you know, medicine is always changing. So that might change in the future, but I certainly don't have, uh, I never have people go on these medications with the goal of that they're going to come off of it someday. So nope. Um, as long as people are tolerating them, usually they're extremely safe. Um, long term for at least the, the times that we've been able to see, of course, for people who are on something like terzepatide, it's slightly newer, so we just don't have the history with that, but um, safety data looks really good. So um, yeah, I don't have a plan to take them off of it um, unless it doesn't work for them. Last question. Okay. Um, what is it with people who think it's okay to call attention to what I'm eating? I grew up overweight and now I'm maintaining a healthy weight. People have nothing else to talk and think about. That is such a good point because uh, I think for anybody who's ever had a health goal, thought about losing weight, you know, uh, started eating healthier, I think what we all realize is that like people have an opinion regardless of what you do. And I don't know what it, maybe it's particularly um, applicable to America or maybe not. Maybe if you're from a different country, please weigh in. But yeah, people will just comment on what you're eating. But you could be eating really healthy. You could be eating, you know, not as healthy as you wanted to in it, whatever, but you know, everybody's going to have an opinion. And I think it's always, um, it's always just important to keep that in mind and not to let that deter you from your goals. Um, I had a patient once who, you know, she didn't want to be the weird one at lunch, bringing her lunch, but you know, she didn't want to eat the pizza that everybody at the office ordered at lunch. So it's really like, okay, you can do whatever you want. Right. But, you know, one of those options is going to get you closer to the goal that you have. So um, it's probably like, you know, people might think that about you, but they might not. And we really can't control that. You know, we can only control what we do. So um, just realize if you are embarking on a health journey that other people will have opinions and that's fine. But we don't have to like pay too much attention to them to these opinions um, or we don't have to take them into account at all and um, what really matters is that you are doing what you want to be doing for your health um, 
And at the end of the day, that's really what's important. So I think that's a great one to um, end on. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to post the, uh, the replay on my YouTube channel. And again, if you um, would like to work with me directly, I'll post that information too. Um, thank you so much for your questions. And um, that's going to do it for today.